Okay, there we go. Okay, so let me switch my view here to uh, the presentation mode. Okay, so uh, I'd like to welcome everybody. Um, so no, the last of the uh, MCNC 2016 Summer Webinar Series. Um, today we're going to talk a little bit about high-level overview of campus network design and operation. Um, my name is Christopher Rose. I'm a senior client network engineer here at MCNC. Um, used to working with the uh, K-12 and the community college uh, community out there. So uh, let's talk a little bit about the agenda as far as what we're actually going to cover um, in today's webinar. Um, basically, we're going to discuss uh, what is a campus network, um, what are the components of a campus network as far as the design aspect. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about the difference between home networks and enterprise class networks and uh, Basically, we're going to, I'm going to leave some time towards the end for folks that have any, any questions. So we'll talk a little bit about the prerequisites and the intended audience for this uh, webinar. Um, as far as prerequisites, there are none. Um, this presentation is basically geared towards a total beginner or a person with little or no networking or IT experience. Um, and I generally geared this particular webinar uh, to folks who are at new charter schools or uh, basically small small schools. Um, but the content really is relevant to anyone who's charged with facilitating uh, bringing up a, a new campus network for an organization or possibly going in and redesigning a uh, you know a network that already exists that may not be performing very well and I'm, I'm assuming that you know as far as my audience that uh, you guys don't have you know like tons of experience uh, so uh, if you're a person who has a lot of uh, networking experience uh, uh, you may already know a lot of this information so let's kind of start out with uh, what is a campus network? You may hear that term kind of tossed around. Um, what, what we define a campus network here for our purposes of our discussion is uh, it's basically the network infrastructure used to deliver networking services to an organization at a particular physical location. Um, and I say that, you know, as far as, you know, uh, I guess uh, defining it as far as a particular physical location because you will run into situations where sometimes an organization has multiple physical locations. So when we use the term campus network, we're basically referring to the network that's at that particular physical location because, you know, that has some, uh, some impact as far as the design goes. So let's, you know, as far as, uh, you know, defining a campus network, let's talk a little bit about basically, well, why do organizations have campus networks? Like if, if I'm basically like if I'm starting a, you know, a, a new network at a, at a startup charter or if I'm redoing a network, um, you know, that, that may not be performing well, you know, a lot of times it helps, you know, if I don't have prior knowledge, well, let's really kind of, define why are we doing this because that kind of helps as far as understanding what we're going to be doing later here as far as the design goes. Um, data networks basically have become critical infrastructure for almost any organization now, uh, especially including schools. Um, you know, as all of you are probably aware, you know, in an increasingly connected world, you know, people expect network services these days. Um, you know, they want to be able to connect with their cell phones, tablets, they want to be able to get internet access. Um, voice telephone networks have been rapidly migrating over to VoIP, um, basically uh, replacing the old uh, analog phone lines with digital phones that essentially send you know telephone conversations as data across networks now instead of you know analog phone signals across copper wires. 
um, proliferation of devices, basically, you know, cell phones, tablets, you know, any of the other personal devices, Apple Watches, that kind of thing that people use to manage their daily lives. Increasingly, people, you know, as far as calendaring, email, staying in touch with their family, things like that, people increasingly have turned to these devices. And, and you know, it's one of the reasons they expect network access, basically. Um, you also have the Internet of Things that's kind of playing into this, too, in that uh, if you're, you know, you're running a, a physical location for an organization, a lot of times these days, you know, the HVAC system, the lighting system, security cameras, things like that, all of those things now that used to be, you know, either analog or hardwired, you know, into various things, uh, you know, the folks who have to manage that stuff these days want to be able to access all that through their computer. Um, so a lot of that stuff has basically been been added to the network. Um, and then as far as, you know, things that are, as far as uh, schools go, you know, things that are really pushing computer usage in schools and need for networks, you know, the teachers essentially have moved to digital technology for learning materials. Um, the uh, state of North Carolina in particular has moved testing and education management tools online, um, you know, things like PowerSchool, Canvas, that type of thing. Um, and then, you know, lessons and homework are shifting to online models as well. So kind of the, the take home from this, particularly like if, you, if you're, you're starting a new charter, is uh, it's really hard to basically to run a school without a network. And, uh, you know, as a result, it's definitely something you want to think about, you know, before doing that. Um, anymore, it's become kind of critical infrastructure. It's almost like having water or power, you know, as far as, as opening an, an organization or, you know, operational efficiency of an organization. It's basically something you just can't live without anymore. So let's now talk just a little bit about, you know, so what kind of services do people expect from a campus network? You know, we've talked about why they need it now, you know, um, so let's talk about, well, what exactly is it people are looking for, you know, as far as a network I have to design for my organization? Well, you know, usually the first thing people start, you know, especially a lot of the engineers start thinking about is, you know, file print and scanning services locally. You know, I need to be able to scan documents in, I need to be able to print, you know, I need to be able to store my files somewhere. Um, you know, right after that is internet access. Basically, the internet is the gateway to almost everything now, especially with things moving up to the cloud. Um, you know, people use that for web browsing, email, delivery of cloud services, like if you're using Google Docs or Office 365, Canvas, PowerSchool, all that stuff you need an internet connection for. Um, increasingly, it's also, you know, these data networks are replacing the old, you know, like cable TV and, you know, other broadcast media. Um, basically, it's becoming a method for content delivery and streaming media. You know, examples like Netflix, YouTube, Amazon, Apple TV. Um, the other thing, you know, would be communication services. Those, as I said before, VoIP especially, but even, you know, more than just voice now these days, people want to use the network for video conferencing, you know, holding web meetings where they share their screens and things, kind of like what I'm doing right now. Um, people also want to be able to, add, if you have local sources like files, you know, or, you know, applications that you have installed locally on your network, people want to be able to get remote access to that from their home. Um, and then lastly, again, building infrastructure, you know, it's that Internet of Things again, you know, the police department want to be able to access the security cameras at your particular office location or the the guys from uh, train or carrier want to be able to monitor the air conditioning system um, you know your uh, your plant engineer people want to be able to know what the temperature in the building you know that kind of thing so now that we've kind of discussed you know what what is a campus network and what is it exactly that people expect from you know designing a good campus network let's let's talk a little bit now about what the kind of the, the nuts and bolts working parts of a successful campus network are um, and I kind of deliberately ordered these this way because uh, you know I think 
importance wise, this first one really is probably the most important. Um, the first, you know, one half of the equation really is the supporting infrastructure. And basically, these are the things that you're going to need in order to operate and maintain this network over the long run. Um, it's things like financing, as far as, you know, the money to be able to buy equipment. Um, obviously, you know, as much as we would all like, you know, none of this stuff is free. Um, and I, I've seen in a lot of cases where particularly, you know, figuring out how to pay for it is sometimes the last thing, you know, people think about. So it's, it's definitely something you want to, you want to ponder. Um, staff, um, you know, having a good, successful campus network, you know, quite frankly, is going to require staff. It's going to require, you know, knowledgeable people, whether they be vendors or people on your staff, you know, who are familiar with design and the operation and the upkeep of the network, you know, for continuing support. You're also going to need vendors. Um, basically, these would be equipment vendors, service vendors, you know, basically the people who you're going to buy your your stuff from and who are going to help you as far as you know setting that up design and uh, you know making sure that it operates efficiently you're gonna need support agreements you know in a lot of cases you know when you buy you know the hardware or the physical infrastructure things like that you're going to need agreements with folks to come in and help you out with things you know high-level expertise type things that you may not have you know the ability to handle on staff but you'll need the ability to basically be able to call someone and ask questions and get answers. And then, you know, lastly in that category, you know, building facilities. Um, it's like, you know, it's like building a castle, basically. You don't want to, you don't want to build your, you know, your castle in a swamp. It needs a good, firm foundation. And really the building facilities are, you can think of as kind of the foundation for a campus network. You know, having proper power, proper cooling you know, uh, well-equipped network closets basically all help as far as, you know, creating a successful campus network. The other half of this equation really is kind of the network itself. And basically this would include the actual hardware equipment and plant infrastructure that come, you know, uh, basically make up the network. This would be things like your switches, you know, your firewall, fiber optic and copper cabling, wireless APs and controllers, servers, that type of thing. So when we're trying to put all this together, um, let's, let, I guess let's think a little bit about what we would consider kind of our areas of primary concern for building a new campus network. You've been tasked with either redesigning an old one or bringing up a new one. Um, and I kind of broke this out. Some of you may, if you've had network assessments done by MCNC, you may recognize, you know, this categorization here because this follows very closely along with uh, uh, our reporting as far as when we do network assessments for folks. And a lot of that is because these really are kind of the key components to putting together a new network. Um, the, the first is uh, basically the, the actual design of the network. Um, basically, you know, is it built to best practices, that type of thing. Um, the plant infrastructure, basically it's things like, do I have the proper cabling, power, cooling, you know, things like that. Um, we want to be concerned about security. When we design this, we want to think about things like, you know, how do we protect ourselves from hackers from the internet? You know, how do we keep people from, you know, creating mischief on our local network? You know, how do we keep ourselves from having our data stolen, you know, that kind of thing. And then, you know, lastly, we want to take a look at, you know, operations, administration, and management. Sometimes we'll abbreviate this as OANM. And basically this covers things like, basically, how am I going to operate this network over the long term? You know, how am I going to take care of it, manage it, and monitor it, you know, so that I know everything's working the way it should. So let's talk a little bit about network design. So when you're trying to bring up a new network, um, as far as network design, there are a couple of things I would I would suggest here. Um, probably the very first thing you're going to want to do is to perform a needs analysis to determine 
the services that you're going to be required to provide. Um, because this is going to directly impact how you actually design the network. Um, basically, you want to sit down with the folks who are the stakeholders, you know, as far as in, in I guess in you guys' cases, this would be like, you know, your teachers, your administrative staff, things like that you know, your board of directors or whatever, and kind of hash out, well, what exactly is it people are looking for as far as what they expect this thing to do, you know, because while we listed a lot of things, it may be in your particular case, well, we're not going to put the security cameras on the network, or, you know, we're not going to, you know, we're going to, we've still got these old analog phones we're going to use, or we're just going to use cell phones, or, you know, there's, there's a lot of things that go into, um, you know, as far as determining the services provided that, you know, can ultimately save you time and money because obviously you don't want to expend effort, you know, to offer services that you're, nobody's going to use. Um, this will also help you really kind of think things through before you start actually trying to put things together and, you know, make plans to purchase things, that type of thing. Now, as far as the actual computer network design, it should follow basic industry best practices. Almost every major network equipment vendor has best practices guides as far as equipment configuration. And uh, while you know we don't endorse any particular vendor here at MCNC, we work with all of the network equipment vendors. Um, I can say Cisco probably has the best documentation as far as you know just architectural best practices and how to configure things and how to kind of design your network. Um, HP also has some good stuff out there as well. Um, I'll provide some links to some of this stuff here a little later in the presentation. So I kind of threw this in there um, mostly just kind of uh, as an observation I've seen, especially when going to a lot of small networks that are just getting started or organizations that are just getting started with networking. Um, basically just want to kind of point out the difference between consumer and enterprise class networking equipment. Um, and what I'm talking about here is when I talk about consumer networks, basically what I'm talking about is equipment that was designed to be used like in a home, um, you know, like APs and routers and things that you'd buy at Walmart and, you know, little unmanaged switches and things like that. Um, I've seen a lot of folks try to build networks, you know, that you know, from this type of equipment, you know, with, uh, I would say would be uh, exaggerated uh, expectations as far as the kind of performance they're going to get out of it. Basically, consumer network equipment is designed, you know, consumer networks are designed to serve less than 10 people and have lower reliability and performance expectations. Um, obviously, your, your network at home that you watch, net, watch Netflix on isn't as important as the network in a you know, in an organization. Um, and consumer-grade equipment is basically designed and priced with this, this kind of uh, thinking in mind. Um, enterprise networks, however, are designed to serve hundreds or more people. And, you know, as a result, you know, the equipment is a lot more expensive. And the reason why is because the performance expectations are a lot higher and reliability expectations are a lot higher. So as a result of this, enterprise class equipment will typically be a lot more expensive than, you know, home grade stuff. I've seen a lot of folks when they go to build a network, especially if they've never done it before, um, you know, and they're used to setting up their network at home, you know, when they start taking a look at enterprise class equipment, uh, you know, they get real sticker shock. Um, so I'm just kind of throwing that out there. I know a lot of times, you know, some of you may be ju justified to, you know, forced to justify why you why it will require this much money to do to do that, you know. So I just kind of threw this out there as a way that you could, you know, try to explain this to other folks, you know, who may not understand this difference. So let's talk about the actual campus network design. Um, Current best practice guides from network vendors basically recommend either a two or a three tier, what they will refer to as a collapsed back backbone network topology. You know, and all of this is dependent on your network size. Um, for small organizations, it's typically going to be a two tier. Um, you know, with 
a larger organization, um, you know, a larger campus with multiple buildings, you're typically going to see a three-tier design. Um, the three tiers of this architecture are basically the core, uh, which contains the routing and switching core of the, the campus network. Um, the reason that these are referred to as class backbone networks are essentially what we've done is we've folded all of the backbone switching and routing into the core. And uh, that's why it's one of the, you know, the key components of this architecture. Um, kind of the middle tier is the distribution tier. Um, basically, it's going to act as a routing and security gateway between the access and core tiers. Um, this is the one that is typically eliminated from a, a two-tier type design. Um, and uh, once I finish explaining this here, I'll have a diagram that makes a lot of this you know, more self-evident here. I know if you're like me, you know, diagram makes a huge difference. Um, but the, the, the last tier is the access tier. This is actually the tier where everyone's going to be plugging in their devices, where the APs are. Basically, it's how the end user is going to access the network and the services that it provides. Um, as I said before, smaller networks you know, may only be a core and an access tier. And this is sometimes, you'll hear this referred to as a collapsed distribution and core network design because essentially uh, you're kind of pushing that distribution tier up into the core because you just don't have that many points of access, basically. Core network design is mostly going to center around switching routing and the wired infrastructure. And wireless, while it's a critical service, is still, you know, as far as this kind of design, is, is an access tier component. Basically, it's not like the centerpiece of your network in the sense of as far as, you know, moving the data around on the network. And I make that point because a lot of times, especially in small organizations, uh, folks will spend a lot of time and effort thinking about wireless access, which is important. But the thing to remember is that your wireless access, you know, all those APs at some point have to connect to some kind of wired infrastructure that basically provides the means for the data to uh, move around, you know, from the wireless end of things to the wired end of things. So uh, I, I point this out again basically to say that, you know, if, if you're going to, you know, definitely spend a lot of time, you know, designing a wireless network, but realize you have to have a very sound wired network behind it in order for it all to work basically the you know to the expectation you set for it so this is kind of a diagram of that design I was telling you about as you can see up here at the top we kind of have our centralized core again this is kind of where we get that uh, that notion of a collapsed backbone network because the backbone here is just contained in the core um, and then what you see here is you know the distribution layer um, if you have a campus that has multiple buildings, a lot of times the distribution layer will basically be like the main switch in any given building. Um, if you don't have multiple buildings, again, this is one of the reasons why this, this tier is one that sometimes you will see basically removed from that, and sometimes you'll just see these connections from the access layer up here to the core. And then obviously down here we have, you know, the access layer with these individual building uh, switches that basically connect all of our, our end users and sometimes you'll see these you know as building IDFs and I guess a little bit of background uh, MDF and IDF are kind of old telecommunications terms uh, MDF means main data frame and IDF means intermediate data frame uh, come from the way the telcos used to uh, wire their closets um, it's kind of carried over into the networking world So what I did here was I basically took that last diagram and I kind of threw wireless in here on top of this just to kind of show you how the wireless component of campus network design fits in with uh, what we were just talking about as our three-tier design. Um, as you can see here, are the APs are hanging off of the distribution layer because, you know, the folks who are accessing services, you know, are going to be interfacing with these APs. Um, it's down here at the access layer. Um, now, in most cases, with most wireless networks, you have some type of controller. Um, and what it used to be, everything would be based around a central controller where, you know, all of this data from these APs would be forwarded up to uh, this wireless controller and then distributed to where it needed 
to go, but uh, what we're increasingly seeing in the wireless market is vendors are moving towards uh, basically almost like like kind of like the Arrowhive model where um, you know there is no centralized controller, but all the APs kind of participate together and as a controller. And in some cases, this controller is actually not even a piece of equipment here anymore. It may be a service up in a cloud somewhere out on the internet. So let's take our three-tier design here and then throw the internet on here. Um, and to answer that question I just got, yes, the core is usually where the main router is kept. Um, and that's one of the reasons they call it the core. It's kind of the uh, layer two, layer three center of the universe as far as your campus network goes. So what I did here was I put kind of how, you know, internet access and the NC REN service fits into this campus network design here. Um, what you see here is a little cloud that's outside of your core. Usually it feeds into your core like this. Obviously there's more equipment here, but uh, we'll get to that here in, in just a moment. So probably the next thing after the actual network design is we should probably talk a bit about plan infrastructure. Um, again, these are the things I mentioned before that it's kind of an, the important foundation you're going to need to build your network. Um, you know, obviously all of these things almost are equally important. Um, you know, power, you definitely, in order to minimize your downtime and, you know, prolong the life of your network equipment, you know, prevent, you know, damage from lightning strikes, brownouts, things like that, you definitely need a stable source of power. And what we mean by that is usually it means, you know, in your network closet, make sure you have UPS power to protect your equipment. You know, and in some cases, if it's deemed necessary, you know, backup generators, possibly, you know, as far as if you need to continue to have the network operational, you know, once power is out and it may be a long time before it's restored, like if you need it for voice services or things like that. The other thing would be cabling. Um, basically, in order to connect all the various network components, you know, you're going to need copper and fiber cable plant is really what it boils down to. And in the in the industry, what you'll hear this called a lot of times is a structured cabling system. Basically, what this means is uh, when you know when I install the cabling, you know, it's done in an orderly fashion, in that I put things in, you know, put patch panels in racks. I have patch panels, you know, as far as flexibility of connecting this to that. Um, you know, there's con proper conduits, uh, you know, things going through, you know, are properly sent through firewalls so it meets fire code, uh, you know, and electrical code, that kind of thing. Um, and then your cabling needs are basically going to determine, you know, where your closet locations, those MDFs and IDFs I was talking about earlier, where those are going to go because particularly in copper cabling, uh, distance limitations are going to determine, you know, how far you can take that cable from, say, a switch over in this closet to a switch over in that closet. Once you, usually with, you know, Cat5, Cat6 cabling, once you get over, I want to say it's 300 meters, I believe, or 150 feet, um, you start running into problems where, you know, the signaling doesn't work right and uh, you'll either need to put a closet or you'll need to think about bridging that distance with fiber. Cooling is definitely another important, important thing. Um, this equipment, it's like any other electrical equipment, it produces heat. Cooling is going to be needed to remove that heat to prevent equipment damage. Um, most switches will operate up to a pretty high temperature, um, so that's not an issue. Um, the one place where cooling and network closets get you is with UPS batteries. Um, those are a, a wear item. Um, they do wear out, and the one thing that all of the manufacturers of the batteries and UPSs know for a fact is that as that room gets hotter, it shortens the life of that battery exponentially. Um, hot network closets, you may be replacing that battery once a year, whereas if the, you know, the temperature is more properly controlled, you may only have to replace that every two or three years. Um, typically, cooling is dealt with, you know, if you're installing a new network in one of two ways, basically you're either going to use the existing building ventilation or HVAC. A lot of times that's totally sufficient. Um, 
you know, other times, you know, you may have so much equipment in a small space, you may have to install some type of dedicated cooling to remove that heat. Um, all of the equipment manufacturers will list, usually in BTUs, you know, the amount of heat that their equipment is going to throw off. Um, you know, when you're setting up your network, definitely talk to the folks who are handling your heating, heating and AC. You know, and uh, once you have those figures and you know how much equipment you're installing, you can tell them essentially basically how much heat load you're going to put in that room and, you know, have them help you figure out a way as far as how to keep it cool enough in there. Last thing to think about is equipment racking, you know, whether that's going in your core network, you know, your closets, basically your distribution closets. Um, all your network equipment really should be mounted in industry standard two or four post racks. Um, and then the other thing to think about is if you're putting this equipment somewhere like say in a classroom or in a hallway or you know somewhere basically where the public can get to it and people can tamper with that equipment you really should put it in a rack that locks and uh, one other thing that sometimes folks will forget about is if you do put it in a rack that locks a lot of times those racks are enclosed definitely make sure that those racks have some type of uh, exhaust fans or something like that in there to help them as far as the cooling goes. So let's talk a little bit about network security here and this is just kind of a very brief overview on this. Obviously network security is a very deep topic and I, my intention here is to not give a you know a complete dress down of the network security topic but this is really just kind of like I said a 10,000 foot overview from the you know the standpoint of a person who's been tasked with building a network. So typically when we talk about network security on a on a campus network we're usually talking about basically configuring security in zones and when we say zones what we really mean are basically you know a zone is basically a group of any number of devices on the network that have like security requirements and access rights. Um, an easy way to think about zones and what you'll see in most typical networks is usually you have like an inside zone which is like your internal devices that you know you know and somewhat trust um, you have like an internet zone that's traffic outside of your network that you don't trust at all um, sometimes you'll have like a zone for your internal server resources because you want to separate that from both your internal users and you want to protect it from the internet in some cases you may have what they call a DMZ or a demilitarized zone. Um, it's kind of like a place where you put uh, servers or things that you may be hosting that both people on the internet will need access to but will also need access to things that you have on your inside network like data on those servers or you know possible end-user devices. Um, primary, your primary network security device on your network is a firewall. Um, basically all a firewall is is a network appliance that's used to enforce access permissions between security zones. Um, I also put in here that layer 3 switches or routers can also enforce those security zones. Um, however, you know, in most cases a firewall is going to be a better way to do that because they're purpose designed for the task. Um, whereas, uh, you know, as far as layer 3 switches and routers, if you try to use those as firewalls, sometimes you may overwhelm the the switch um, but it's perfectly okay you know to use these for small areas you know if you have a small zone you don't have a ton of traffic and you just need you know some ACLs in there it's it's okay to put you know think about putting that load on on the switch as well you know depending on the size of the network um, one of the last things is you know content filtering of some type is basically going to be required on these school networks mostly because of the the SIPA you know the Child Internet Protection Act and I'm sure you know all of you, you know, are probably aware of that. And like I said, this 10,000 foot overview kind of things to think about. Obviously, it's a much more detailed topic, um, but uh, these are the really important things. And I really just can't say enough about, you know, zoning when you're designing your network. This is one of the places where you can have the most impact as far as you know making a network that's secure and uh, able to grow over time and continue to be secure as if you properly zone things in the beginning you know think about basically what your security requirements are so what I did here is basically I kinda tried to pull all of this together 
Um, what we see here is basically a three-tier campus network design with a firewall and security zoning and internet access and wireless. Um, what you'll notice may be a little different from the last diagram is basically we have a firewall here that sits between the internet and our internal network here and our network core. Um, you know, what you'll notice here as far as zoning, you know, you'll notice that I have over here, uh, you know, a section here that I've set up for DMZ servers. These may be things like web, web servers, Moodle servers, you know, that kind of th any resource basically that you're sharing with the public, um, put it here, you know, and allow the firewall to control access from both the inside and the internet. Um, same thing if you have uh, internal resources, you know, like file and print servers, directory services, that kind of thing. Um, you know, I put these off a, another zone here on this firewall here. And then you see the rest of the, you know, the network design where you have the core and you have distribution and you have your access layers and obviously your wireless. So the last piece of this I wanted to talk about is kind of the OA and M, the operations administration and management. Um, and this is an, an equally important topic, and this is, uh, you know, one of the ones that I see most often neglected, especially in networks when people are just beginning to kind of get their feet in network design and, uh, you know, trying to bring up a, a network for a new organization. Um, basically, all networks are going to require some type of care and feeding. Um, and OA and M functions are basically what help make that network operate efficiently over time and, and give you the level of uh, reliability and performance that you and your users expect. Um, basically, these things are going to require the regular attention of a vendor or staff. And I uh, can't point that out enough in that I've seen a lot of, a lot of times where folks will have staff that may split uh, responsibilities, you know, and in some cases you may be able to do that, but, the, the, you know, obviously the thing to remember is, you know, depending on, you know, the criticality of the network to, you know, the organizational objectives, you know, in some cases it may require full-time staffing in order to do that. And uh, I know it's expensive, but, you know, it's it's something to remember. Um, OA&M is usually performed by various, you know, software services or packages, but it also includes procedures and processes. Um, I kind of pointed that out because I know a lot of times people like, you know, go out and buy some network management platform or bring a vendor in, but a lot of times a lot of the pieces of, you know, this part of the network design are just, it's workflow things that, you know, it's things like, you know, who's going to handle doing the backups, who's going to handle, you know, taking the end user calls, you know, who, what's our call list where if we have a problem or this or that or whatever, you know, these are all things you want to try to think about ahead of time instead of having to try to worry about the day that you're having a huge problem. You know, examples of OANM type functionality, you know, would include like help desk, you know, who are all my users going to call when they have a problem? Who do I call when, you know, the network has issues? Um, some type of network up down monitoring software so I know you know ahead of time when something's having an issue um, you know some type of rudimentary network performance monitoring software um, basically let me know how my op my networks currently operating you know so I'll know ahead of time if users are going to start seeing performance issues or if there's a problem I need to look into um, network logging software you know as far as syslog servers things like that so that you can keep track of all the errors on your network. It helps you correlate things that happen on your network so that when you go to troubleshoot, you can, you know, look at what events happen when and where. And a lot of times that helps you figure out what the problem is. Um, you also have usually software to back up and manage your device configuration so that, you know, like if your firewall dies one day, well, you have a backup of the configuration, you know, so we can just load that on a new piece of hardware and put that in, you know, when when we get it. Um, and really, really important here, neglecting operations, administration, and management in your network design can lead to perceivable network reliability issues and put staff in a reactive rather than proactive mode of work. 
This is one of the things that I see the most office, often when I do network assessments, particularly for small organizations and their networks, is a lot of times because they don't have OANM things planned out as part of the network design process, uh, the staff are in a really, you know, kind of fire stomping reactive mode, which can be really exhausting, you know, both mentally and, and kind of taxes everyone's nerves. And it, it kind of gives users, you know, the impression that the, the network isn't really reliable, which isn't something, you know, you want to you wanna do. So let's kind of tie all this together here since we're getting close to our, our ending time here, um, at least if that that phone is, or that clock over there is correct. I think it's a little fast based on my, my cell phone time here. Um, so efficient and reliable campus networks don't happen by accident. I basically, I can't emphasize that enough. They are designed that way. Um, the point I'm trying to make here is really, these things require thought. This isn't something that you can, you know, walk into a building, you know, two weeks before you're ready to start you know, start school or operating, you know, operations for your organization. This is something that really needs to be thought about, you know, from the very beginning and something that needs to be planned for. Um, I have, you know, in a number of cases, I have helped people basically almost put together kind of like fire sale type networks, you know, because nothing had been planned. Um, you know, obviously, if you guys are listening to this, then you guys are the guys that, you know, tend to probably want to try to think about these things beforehand. <laughs> um, the other thing I'd point out is design involves thinking about more than just buying hardware. That's another mistake I see a lot of folks make is they just, you know, think about, oh, I just need to buy some switches or some firewall, you know, get a firewall or whatever. But there's really a lot more to this. You really, when you're doing the design, you need to do some type of needs analysis and security analysis you know, and make some kind of plans for ongoing maintenance and operations. Um, you know, can't, can't overstate that. And as a result of all this, you know, if you are a beginner with this and you have questions or if you're not sure of what you're doing, you know, bringing, bringing up a, a network for an organization can be a huge responsibility. Um, don't be afraid to engage outside design help, you know, when your in-house resources lack the design experience or if you just don't know or you just have questions. Um, you know, folks like us here at MCNC, you know, are freely available here to help you. Um, we like doing this kind of thing with customers. Um, the other thing is your vendors and, you know, uh, your other resources are usually there to help you too. A lot of cases, if you're talking about buying a network from somebody, they usually have uh, design staff, you know, design folks on staff who can help you work these things out. Um, and if you know all of these kind of pieces before you start talking to them, you'll find it's a, a, a much easier experience because, you know, you'll know exactly what they're going to be asking you about, you know, before you go in to talk to them. The other thing I'll point out too is just, you know, a little bit of time and money spent up front can save you a whole lot of headaches and growing pains later. Um, you know, network campus networks that are put together using kind of these, you know, design best practices, both, you know, as far as how the actual hardware is put together, you know, the, the tiering of the network, um, you know, operations and administration practices, uh, security, and, uh, uh, you know, good plant infrastructure, you know, if you, you do all of this ahead of time, you know, it makes this network so that when your organization expands, say, you know, you're a small charter and you have, you know, an elementary school, well, now you're getting ready to add a middle school. If that network that you initially set up is properly designed, you know, expanding that network should be a breeze. It's really just about scaling up the hardware and just scaling up the practices you already have in place and the design. So I put some links here as far as uh, where you can go for an additional information uh, and support. And I have a couple others that I'm actually going to add to this. So if you go down to the website later to download this, uh, there will be a few more links in here. Um, I kind of put the Cisco Campus Network Design Best Practice Guide in here. And then uh, the University of Oregon had a really good design principles 
uh, thing as well. And then, like I said, there's a couple of others that I, I need to add in here that I just I found earlier this morning. So I guess uh, we're at the point now where, uh, you know, we have anybody have any questions or, uh, you know, things that you want to ask. I think I'm going to have to un unshare my screen here just so I can uh, take a look here. Um, Susan, and it looks like you're asking, is there uh, hands-on training uh, at NC Ren in, uh, you mean in network design? Ah, uh, yes. Um, so Susan's asking here about um, uh, training for Wi-Fi training in September for charter schools. Um, as I heard yesterday, that is actually coming. Um, I am not sure personally of the details here, but I will um, hunt that down and uh, get that information for you, Susan, or uh, if anyone else is interested in that. Um, not there is no date yet that I'm I'm aware of, but it could just be because I'm not aware of it. <laughs> okay, I will uh, let me uh, have you guys uh, shoot me your email addresses here, Susan and uh, Greg, and I'll make sure that I get that information over to you here. In fact, if you guys want to, you can just uh, you can just drop me an email, and uh, I'd be more than happy to hunt down that information for you. Um, any other questions, comments? I guess the one thing I, I I forgot to kind of put up here is uh, this: uh, your feedback is important. Uh, Basically, uh, you know, if you have comments, you liked it, you didn't like it, you think we can do something different or talk about something better next time, uh, I have a link here in the actual uh, slide deck that will point you to the Summer Webinar website where you guys can basically leave your comments, you know, and uh, we do read all of this feedback and we try to incorporate this as far as making changes and obviously trying to keep these things interesting and relevant as far as what you guys are looking for, so... I guess if there are uh, no other questions, then uh, I will uh, I will go. Although it looks like I got somebody typing here, so I'll give them just Susan just a second here. Yes, Susan, I uh, I will go ahead and send you the link to uh, the Cisco information as well. No problem there. So I guess if uh, I guess if that's uh, that's everything, and no one has any further questions, I'm going to go ahead and close this one out. Um, I would like to thank you all again for your uh, your participation and listening. And uh, like I said, uh, don't be afraid to go and leave your feedback. And I uh, look forward to uh, seeing and talking to you guys again sometime. Take care.